Well, it is. Uh, I, I hate to see it come to an end. It's just, it's always so strange. Uh, you wait, you, we make the plans. I don't remember exactly when I invited uh, Scott. It was right after I'd talked with Bill and invited Bill. And you wait all that time and you make all the preparations and it started on Friday night and you blink your eyes and we're at the end of it. Uh, but uh, it has, I don't know about you, I, I'm quite certain if you're like me, you have been truly blessed uh, by the messages that you've heard over the last two days. And I know we'll be blessed again today. I have uh, counted it a privilege and an honor to have Scott in my home, in our home, not my home, our home. And uh, the, the time that we've got to spend together and, and uh, talk about the gospel, about things that are important to us has just been such an encouragement to me. And I, I count him a dear brother in Christ, and I cherish his friendship. My trust that he'll come to us one more time again this morning and preach the gospel to us. Scott, you come and you close as you see me. <clears throat> You go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> We're going to be there again for the third time. And if I had the time to express my gratitude for this weekend, I, I'd have to do a part four, an hour long, but I won't do that. I just appreciate the hospitality and meeting everybody and, and very much enjoyed it. Even look forward to the fellowship after these two messages. So far, we've done two parts uh, in Romans 9, and I've entitled them uh, Unconditional Double Predestination. And this is subtitled, The Condition of the One Lump, which is featured in verse 21. So I'm not going to spend too much time reviewing. I don't even know how far I'm going to get in this message. I try, I'm going to try to um, not put people to sleep. We've got to give Bill some space to preach. But we're going to focus on verse 21. The first message focused on verse 11. And I had mentioned that there are three key verses in this chapter to understand um, the detail and distinctions of what I'm talking about. Verse 11, verse 14, and verse 21. And there are... Uh, various views in this chapter. We talked about the, the free willer or the Arminian. He'll try to just dismiss this whole chapter as not being about salvation at all, saying it's uh, a call unto service or uh, it's about two nations and so on. But I think so far we've seen um, quite easily this is talking about salvation. We didn't even look at the context before and after. But it is dealing with salvation. We're looking at um, the biblical view of God not apologizing for his absolute sovereignty. We had talked about in the previous messages that God's chief concern is his own glory, and specifically in the death of his son. Everything else lines up behind that as far as priority is concerned. And he doesn't mess around with that. He's a jealous God, and if that's his chief concern, Anything that goes against that, say, for example, universal atonement, which would be a Christ, a false Christ, dying for everyone, and not everyone is saved. Most people go to hell in that scheme. That is satanic. That is a false gospel. No one has ever been saved believing that lie. God doesn't save through the means of lies. He saves by the offense of the cross, which is the opposite of lies. The offense is Christ's righteousness, without any competition, no rival righteousnesses, no competition with the very thing that's most precious to him. It's the Lord our righteousness, his son. He came and he established righteousness, and that is to be imputed to each and every one of God's people for their justification. And God doesn't play when it comes to that. And some people uh, unwittingly believe a false gospel. Most people do. They're deceived. We know about false teachers. It says that uh, in the latter times that, you know, evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceive, deceiving others and being deceived. 
I would imagine there's a, a handful of false teachers that know what they're doing and they're just, you know, scamming people for money. But I think the majority are, are deceived. And they'll be like those ones in Matthew 7 in that day. And they'll be offering that plea of their own righteousness up until that very last second before they are condemned by, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity or lawlessness. That whole scheme, what we just said, is connected to what we're talking about today. We talked about how that the Trinitarian aspect of salvation is the eternal purpose, the execution by Christ, and the application in time in our own experience. And all of that is of the Lord. Salvation by God's free and sovereign grace in every part of it. There is nothing, I repeat, nothing that we do to gain or maintain or merit or, you know, get a leg up on anything to do with this thing, salvation. It's all of the Lord from start to finish. So it would be good to get it straight from the start when we're talking about eternal things. Because if you don't, we're going to mess up all along the way. And I'm going to give a couple examples of how that in, in time, when it comes to delivering the gospel, how some people pervert that. And if you investigate, they've probably screwed up at the cross, and they've probably screwed up in eternity past when it comes to these things. In other words, everything's connected. So yesterday, mainly, we looked at verses 14 through 20. And in 11, we highlighted that of when these twins were elected to either life or condemnation. And it was before the foundation of the world. And it also was unconditional. It would, had, had nothing to do with, the text says, neither having done any good or evil, which it even excludes the idea of the imputation of Adam's sin. That is not even considered. So this election was previous to that in the mind of God when he viewed what we're going to talk about today, this one lump, the same lump. And in verse 14, after he said in 13 about hating Esau and loving Jacob, there is a reaction there of an objection that was anticipated by, of course, uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit, had Paul write and ask that question, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, or let it, let it never be said. And the argument there, we looked at it yesterday, the argument for defending the sovereignty of God is as hard as God states it. And it is in that way that the objection is given, like that's not fair. And I gave a uh, sort of a, a hypothetical conversation that, that I've seen for decades of people that try to soften the absolute sovereignty of God, the purpose of God within himself, as we've talked about. They'll try to soften it, and, and we use this phrase, to try to get God off the hook so that he doesn't look too sovereign, because that's too scary. I mean, you want to get as many people saved as possible, right? you got to bring them in, and you got to take that narrow gate, and you just, we're going to make a change here, and we're going to widen that gate. And I said, when you do that, you, you close the gate. You turn it into a false gospel. So the objection is a hard objection because this truth is a hard truth that uh, God's people are awakened to and their heart is softened, they, get, they have a new heart and they're able to see that this is the God that we serve, this is the God that we worship, this is the only one available, right? It is not uh, the softening so you can bring others in and say, you know, we'll agree to disagree on this thing of, of uh, God's particular people and, and the accomplished work of Christ. We'll agree to disagree and I get it, it's just, it's a different perspective I know and Give, her, give me a shake here, brother, which we can't do that. That's a, that's a compromise. And so these errors, these heresies drift over into evangelism, and they are developed to d manipulate the psychology of the hero to bring more people in. Anywhere from the most extreme where, where you're familiar with the altar call imitation system, um, Charles Finney started it, and Billy Sunday, and on down to Billy Graham and so on. Moody, D.L. Moody did it. And um, some of these people, Billy Graham admitted that 
in those stadiums, he would have plants. People worked for him up in the stadium that would come down first. And people would see that, well, okay, they're coming down, I can come down. But of course, Billy didn't preach the gospel. So whatever they talk about up front there when they have these counselors lead people to Christ, uh, they didn't hear the gospel in the first place. And so, you know, people are just signing up to be one more person deceived in that system. Some of us experienced that. I was, uh, I made my first false profession at age 12 through that system, the sinner's prayer. So, verse 14, that objection is hard and the offense of the cross, the offense of God's sovereignty in, in reference to this particular salvation of a particular people, there is an objection of like unfairness. And I gave that hypothetical conversation of stuff I've seen for years, how that they tame that down. They, they say, well, look, let me reason with you here so you're, you're not as objectionable. I don't have it memorized, but I, it was about three paragraphs. But the idea was these people were already fallen. And when he chose them, they were already going to hell. And God was not obligated to save them. And, and uh, he, he permitted those others. He passed them by and permitted them. And all that language of permission and letting them slide so that God could have a hands off so he can't be accused of being blamed for being sovereign. That's typical. That's the majority of Sovereign Grace Calvinist Reform people. I would say 95% of them hold to that view. And there, there's, there's other things that come from that, and we'll look at a few of those as we go along. So verse 21, we're going to be looking at this idea of the same lump. It says that this potter took from among this one lump, and then, so here's the question as we examine this, which is tied to the other two messages. Is this one lump a, a pre-fallen lump or a post-fallen lump? And I hope by now you see that it does matter, and if not, hopefully by the end of this message. Remember, God declares the end from the beginning, and we had mentioned that in between the end and the beginning, it's primarily mostly means, and those are predestinated means, right? God thinks way different than we do. I mean, he is a God that has an e one eternal unchanging thought. He doesn't do a plan B and like, oh, I messed up. I better do this. Now, if there's anything in the scripture that some people think even indicates that, it is this, this, these human terms that are brought down to our level. Some of you might be familiar with the word anthropomorphic, anthro meaning man, and this morph idea is changes so that man can understand language. We know that, that God does not have eyes, he's spirit. He doesn't have arms. These, these, this wording is, is in here so that we can kind of start to get a grip on, <clears throat> you know, who God is as far as like he, he's, om, he's omniscient, he's everywhere, he can see everything, and so the word eyes is used. So he doesn't literally have eyeballs. Only the Lord Jesus Christ, as he was incarnate, had eyes. But the Old Testament uses a lot of that language. So you'll see some people come against our view saying that God changes. And they'll take that idea that God repented and they'll try to, you've heard those things. So he declared the end from the beginning and he predestinated all the means in between and, and those things are important to him too. He's the, he's the one that did it. He decided all those things in the middle and most of the things in the middle, that's what we see, that's what we experience. And we can't take credit for any of those things. They're just as miraculous as these eternal things that, that we weren't around to see but now we're seeing them you hear charismatics and stuff talk about miracles. Everything's a miracle. <laughs> Everything is supernatural, right? Everything God does is supernatural. So he is the only one and true God, and, and he, he would do these things in a, as, as we sum up all the text in a, in a Christ-centered way. Christ is given all preeminence in the economy of the Trinity. And again, it is the purpose of, within himself and not reactionary. That's key. God is not reactionary. 
if he's reactionary, he's reacting to something outside of himself, but his purpose is within himself. We saw that in Ephesians 1.9. So these things, I came out of a group, and, and, and Bill and Richard kind of came away from some people decades ago that like to kind of push this idea of mystery and paradox and um, secrecy, and we just can't know anything, and there was this idea of promotion of ignorance, uh, sort of, I thought, under the guise of humility. And what it did is it, the people in the pew, it didn't encourage them to study and, and go further in the Scripture. And I, I've told our people uh, at our church uh, to, to challenge each other, challenge me. Uh, I'm not afraid to have somebody in our church be smarter than me in anything. I hope they all become smarter than me in everything. And then we can communicate and in unity have the same doctrine. And so this idea of uh, sometimes churches and pastors, the way that they're run, it affects what type of doctrine people know and learn. And we can't suppress knowledge. Knowledge is something that that God talks a lot about. And as I said, I think it was yesterday, uh, there is not one good thing in the scripture about ignorance. Ignorance is not bliss. It's detrimental. It'll affect the quality of your spiritual life, your assurance, and all these other things. So we should, we should, we should push for study, meditating, asking questions. Uh, don't be afraid to be challenged. Don't be afraid to say you don't know something, right? If I don't know something, I'll tell somebody. I'll say, you know what, I'll, I'll jot that down. Or I might say it's not even important. I don't know why you brought it up. <laughs> no, but a lot of times I'll just say, look, I've been thinking about that. I I'm going to get to that. Or I'll ask somebody else that I think knows it, and I'll ask them. Um, I know you kind of laugh there, but sometimes people, they'll ask about, you know, aliens, dinosaurs, the guy on a desert island, the flat earth, you know, things like that. Which, I, you know, I don't even know what the shape of the earth is. I have a bad enough problem just cutting my grass, you know. Uh, and it's not flat. There's some hills. So I don't know. I don't care. Uh, we've talked, uh, I think Kenny was saying, don't care if it's a tube or a triangle. or I don't care. It's not a gospel issue. I know that. So we saw uh, that Paul, as he was going through this argumentation, these layers of argumentation, concerning the objection, he poured it on and he didn't soften it. He doubled down on God's purpose within himself. He didn't back off. We saw that like three times in a row. And so that, after we see that, we, you know, think about Esau, Pharaoh, and even Judas, which was more kind of current between uh, Esau and Pharaoh. Judas, we saw how that worked out. We know that that was predetermined. And we saw it in action. Like Christ said, go ahead and do it. You're going to do it. You know? Judas is not trying to resist his will and say, no, I'm not going to do it. He did it, right? He couldn't not do it. And then you have people like, say, for example, John MacArthur. And I had a quote yesterday. I just didn't do it. But just in short, John MacArthur, he had a message, and he said that, Christ tried to reach Judas, and he was trying to get the gospel to him. And when he dipped the sop and he, you know, he gave him the stuff, he said that was honoring Judas. And he tried to reach Judas, and Judas didn't, he didn't believe. So there's, and this fellow claims to believe the doctrines of grace. Here's where we're at in the theological landscape of these United States. And he's got a gigantic following. And when you show these things to some of his fanboys, They'll block you on social media. They'll get mad. I'll say, do you want more? I'll just tip the iceberg. I can send you all kind of videos and articles. No. So there, there's the implications of that. It, it kind of rolls downhill, as they say. And um, it changes things along the way and softens God's sovereignty throughout. So... It, it leads us to a question is, we see the Esau and Pharaoh, and, and I brought up Judas. Is God willing that they perish? 
you know, a lot of times people will go to the text in uh, uh, three nine and then the one in uh, Timothy is it first Timothy two four or second anyway the one that he would have all men come to the knowledge and believe the truth and they'll take those things and they'll say well there's there's this great mystery and this mystery uh, I, mean, I did two messages after these three at our church I did two messages one on against common grace and one against the well men offer and I quoted John Murray and Louis Burkoff from their systematic theologies, and they talked about that there is this will of God that is outside of his decree, that he desires the salvation of the reprobate. And because it's outside of his decree, we're going to count it as a mystery, and we can't say much more about it. Anybody ever hear something about it is a mystery, and I can't explain it, and I don't understand it, so let's not talk about it, but then they'll spend 45 minutes talking about it and the 45 minutes of talking about it does not make sense and so we've got that going on all over the place so the the non-elect the reprobate who God hates hated before the foundation of the world unconditionally do you think he's willing that they perish yes <laughs> they're going to he's willing that's not going to change and God's not uptight about it. He's not, he's not fretting about it. Like, you know, I wish I would have elected them people. Why didn't I do that back then? God doesn't work that way. Now, here's a simple question. When it comes down to in time, real time experience where the gospel is being preached, and, and we can look at that, and these other fellows say that he's not willing any should perish, and that this gospel is a well-meant offer by God that he did, does desire the non-elect to be saved. I mean, you already have some problems there, but think one step further relative to this question about the reprobate when, when the gospel comes to them under the preaching of whatever gospel that is. What would God have to do? Regenerate. Why didn't he just regenerate if he wants them to be? Well, first of all, we know he didn't love them. He didn't choose them. I mean, that's the problem back there. But even in time, if these people are saying God desires their salvation. Well, these people believe that regeneration is before faith, and they can't believe unless they're regenerated. Is God confused? Is God schizo? I'm going to give this sinner space. The gospel comes, and God's like, well... I mean, think about it. All he's got to do is regenerate, give faith and repentance. That'd be a done deal. So this idea of God desiring something he can't have or can't get done, which is tied to his previous forgetting to elect them in the first place, none of this makes sense. It's an Alice in Wonderland type atmosphere. Up, and, up is down and down is up. Better is sweet. Makes no sense. But some people will die on that hill, and they'll double down on that heresy and have that God that's frustrated. <clears throat> so until and unless God gives them life and gives them faith, and we can talk that way because we don't know who's elect or not elect. We don't know what happened back here. As we experience things and, and preach the gospel, we're, we're just concerned about preaching the truth. And we're not in charge of the results, right? We just plant and water, and God gives the increase. And again, it goes after that twofold purpose, either to convert or to harden. And a lot of people don't like the harden thing, and that's kind of what we've been talking about here. It was in the text. You have compassion on him, you have compassion, and what he will do? He'll harden whom he will. All right, so we're starting to see, hopefully, all the inconsistencies we can just call them lies. I'm, I'm more comfortable with that, especially when you bring out the inconsistencies and explain the implications. And you ask people, are you sure this is what you mean? And they say, yeah, and they double down and triple down and quadruple down. Then they see, I think, clearly, I'm saying it's a lie. It's not just a different perspective. And so that's when we can get places. And you can do that in a, in a patient, humble caring way. You don't have to be, stand over people and yell and spit and get red-faced. So we're going to be looking at this uh, verse 21 
and kind of look at this for a little while. I forgot to click on my audio thing. How long have I been going, Richard? Do you know? Okay. So does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel to honor and the other to dishonor? It's a question. The question has a context we've already dealt with, 11 through 20, and this should be an easy answer by now. Now, the word power here is a little bit more than just can he do it. Does he have the ability to do it? This has to do more with authority, the divine right as God to do this. Him possessing all his character attributes of, of sovereignty and, and everything. And we had spoken about this thing of love and election has to do with his sovereignty primarily and not necessarily his justice. Even though this is a just God that's exercising his sovereignty, the spotlight is on sovereignty. And I, I went further and explained, and I don't hear many people talking about this, and I hadn't thought about it for the last few, until the last few years, that when God elected or loved his people, he didn't do this thing that the Arminians say, where he looked down through the future and then viewed them in Christ in this way, that law and justice was satisfied, and then he said, okay, now I can love them. Christ made them lovable. That is not the truth. He sent his son, John 3, 16, the verse that maybe everybody's tired of looking at because it just became a debate with the Armenians. John 6, uh, 3, 16 says the manner in which he, why he sent his son. Is, and then the propitiation he was talking about yesterday, Richard, at your house, uh, 1 John 4. This is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation. Not that he looked down through the future and saw, okay, he's propitiated now. Christ, thanks for making him lovable. Now I love him. No, that's not the way it works. Which this only strengthens what we're talking about in Romans 9 when you see what I just said as, as a truth. So he has the right, the sovereign divine right or authority or warrant to do this without being questioned. He's God, we're not. And that's all over the scriptures, not just Romans 9. I think most of you guys know that. Notice how it goes on. It says, from the same lump. As you guys well know, when you read texts, especially texts that are controversial, you need to slow down. You need to slow down. I, I don't care how long you've been in it. Um, what you think you know about a certain original languages, slow down. Read them in their context. Slow down reading the context. You know, bring these things together, think on them, ponder them. And you know, the more you look at things, uh, the, the more you see after. You just keep looking at it, keep reading it. The same lump. So it's obvious we're talking about one lump was the start. And it says to make one vessel unto honor and the other unto dishonor. That's, that's a question still. Again, the question needs to go back to the to try to make sure you didn't misconceive verse 11 and the objection in verse 14. So if you go to verse 11 and say, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, God's looking at these twins falling in uh, Adam already. Well, you're going you're gonna to blow everything after verse 11. That's, that's not what it says. Because if it was, there wouldn't be that big of an objection in verse 14. People would, with their own human understanding, say, oh, I get it, I get it. That's not a big deal. I, I don't know why I got upset. Thank you, Calmanian, for explaining your weak view of God's sovereignty, what's left of it, since you apologized for him for a half hour, and you got him off the hook for it. So you get the idea. But God... Here's the question. Did God view this one, the same lump of all humanity in Adam's already fallen race, or did he view that lump pre-fallen, or in other words, not yet fallen, 
when you look at the language of the text in the context, especially verse 11 and 14. It goes on to say, <clears throat> we'll kind of we'll play with both sides a little bit to see the difference here. From the same lump to make one vessel into honor and, and dishonor. So the, so the fallen lump view, which I think is the weaker view, the fallen lump, already looking at them fallen in Adam, is leaving the non-elect, the reprobate is already a dishonoring lump, and they're going to stay dishonored. First of all, does the text say that? The question is, why would he even have to form them to dishonor if they were already viewed as already fallen in a dishonorable lump? He gets specific in the text. So the, this lower view or weaker view, and I'm going to, I don't think I've used these terms yet. I'm going to do it once and get it over with. This is called, this is called infralapsarianism. It's the, it's the, I think, the weaker view. Infralapsarianism. Uh, and I might talk a little bit more about what that means, but I, I kind of already have in the context of, of explaining things. There's some more particulars about it that we can talk about. So the potter takes the same lump as already fallen, right, in that view. And the potter separates or splits into two peoples from that fallen lump. And what he's doing is he's choosing sinners from among sinners in this view. Already sinners. But wasn't that group already dishonorable? As I said, according to this other view and already fallen according to that view. So the language, it doesn't seem to work here because we've already dealt with that in verse 11 before they're born, having not done any good or evil, which would also take into consideration, uh, you, don't, you don't need to put Adam in there because it says before done any good or evil. I know, I know imputed sin is effectual, and that would mean they were evil. We can't even look at that. We have to dismiss that. We had to dismiss the fact that Jacob seemed like kind of a knucklehead to be around, and, and Esau was probably a guy I'd want to hang out with, and they brought those arguments. See, God does the very opposite. And we had to take that off the table because it doesn't matter according to verse 11. Sermons like that are a waste of time. I talked about it when I was a youngster until I, I saw the clarity of the text here. So again, we're bringing this to the purpose of God within himself, not reactionary. It says, not of works, and God gets the credit, but of him that calleth. Full credit, full honor, full glory on the one who is the difference maker, who is the chooser, without any consideration of outside influence, the purpose within himself. So we see that God, in the view of choosing from an unfallen, so we're shifting gears and and this view is called supra, supra lapse, just like the car, supra, supra lapsarianism. Okay? Pre fall race. So he, he chooses men from among men, not men from among sinners. Okay? That's the difference. And I hope by now you see it's a big difference. It changes the whole tone of that chapter. <clears throat> so he sovereignly forms from that lump two distinct types to be two distinct things, either honorable or dishonorable. In other words, they were not already dishonorable. He says, I'm going to just leave them dishonorable. The text does not say that. You can't get that out of the text at all in any way, shape, or form. So the natural objection comes in the in the in strength from the one that's objecting that this, this can't be undone. You're, you've talked about this strong language in verse uh, 11, the objection in verse 14, and now the one lump. And it is, it, it seems like there it goes. You know, Paul doubled down on the, this is it. You know, God is sovereign. We've got to face that. And then people say, there really is nothing that I can do to make the difference. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought that's what he's been saying all along. Sometimes we, we think about things, and uh, I mean even events where something 
kind of crazy will happen. And it takes us a while to get used to it. It's like surreal. Whether it be uh, someone passed away or I just won the lottery or whatever, it's like I remember uh, when my, uh, my first child, my daughter, was born. And uh, I think I was 21. And um, my wife was at the hospital. And my cousins came over. First time I ever played music with anybody. I played the drums just by myself to the radio. My cousins came over, and, and I'm glad they did it. Kind of got my mind off. I was kind of like, I really am a dad now. <laughs> They're just like 15 miles away at a hospital. And after them helping me get my mind off it, all right, this, I, I got to go to the hospital. We're going to get out of the hospital. I got to do all these things the rest of my life. You know, it's my responsibility. Then here came a second and a third, and then grandkids and still dealing with them. But sometimes things, it takes a while to kick in, you know? And it's the same with the scripture. We, you know, again, last night I said, we don't know it all. Nobody has ever known it all except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in the incarnation, he had to, as a human, he had to learn. And <laughs> sometimes we gotta, we gotta process that in our mind too about who he was and what he went through. And we continue to learn and grow in, those, in the person and the work of Christ. But God gives us enough knowledge at the beginning. John 17, 3, this is life eternal that you may know me. He gives us enough. And he gives us an understanding concerning that knowledge. And none of that is meritorious. We don't study ourselves to heaven. It's revelatory. He reveals it to us by his grace. And we take no credit for it. All the reason to be more specific and careful about how we deliver the means it's got to be clear. It's got to be true, right? So this view that I'm presenting, that I have held since about like, it's like 1991, three years after I was converted, I've heard it for the longest time, the objections that, that kind of match verse 14. Well, your God is a monster. You're a fatalist. Uh, you're a hyper-Calvinist. Uh, I didn't know Calvin was standard, first of all. You've taken God's sovereignty too far, and thus you're making him not the God of the Bible. And so we take the sovereignty of God as far as the text does. That's our responsibility. We don't stop short. We don't go over it. What does the text say? The truth is more important than we are. So those people that would have that attitude, this, this kind of starts to go downhill towards some other problems. As I had mentioned, uh, this well-men offer the gospel where they say that God desires the salvation of the non-elect. But it has to do also with, like, they'll start talking about tinkering with the love of God. They'll talk about this thing, common grace, right? And they'll try to use Matthew 5, it, it rains on the just and the unjust. Uh, well, you know, it also droughts on the just and the unjust. It also floods. I mean, look at Noah. Was that God's blessing to those that drown? Is that evidence of his love? And you see these memes where uh, Noah threw this life ring, it said, smile, God loves you, and these people are drowning. Is that the expression of God's love toward those that perished? No. No, this thing of common grace is something that would be silly. Some of these street preachers, if they got on a little, their little milk cartons and had their megaphones and said, don't you see God loves you? He's given you rain and he's given you some food. Well, some people are fattened up for the slaughter. The more people get the non-elect, the more they get, the more they're accountable for, whether it be stuff or truth. And if a guy hears the gospel for 70 years and he doesn't believe it because he's not elect, he has treasured up and stored up that much wrath of accountability for not believing the gospel. So it's not like saying, well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's God's common grace that he gives people another few minutes to breathe oxygen. Um, the longer they get, the worse it's going to be for them because the more accountable they're going to be. They're being fattened up for the slaughter. 
There's texts that explicitly say this. In Psalm 73 and, and some other things, their feet are put in slippery places. We need to warm up to these ideas because they're in, they're in the Scripture. It's stuff God says about himself concerning the purpose within himself. Again, and what God actually desires, you know, it's foolish to, to talk about a God who has these unfulfilled uh, desires that he's aggravated concerning it. Also, we'll drift into the, the start tinkering with the cross where it comes to expanding the cross further out than a particular people, whether it be some form of a universal sufficiency, it's sufficient for everybody but only efficient for the elect, some form of a hypothetical universalism, uh, then you branch into what's called Amaraldianism, four-point cal, you know, all this stuff is, you don't tinker with the cross. That's his chief concern. When you start tinkering with the cross, you take away the offense of the cross. Then you take away the gospel. And then, of course, there's ideas of different forms or levels that they would say that people have some part of a free will, right? All this stuff is just like going back to forms of false religion, self-righteous Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, Arminianism, uh, whatever. I want to read that quote one more time from the famous guy they call the Prince of Preachers. And I'm reading it because I disagree with it. And I want you to see now, by now, have you understood why that it's wrong? It's a quote um, from a commentary by a guy named Newell. Uh, and it was talking about Spurgeon. This quote's attributed to Spurgeon as he preached about Jacob and Esau. And he says this, As to Jacob I love, but Esau have I hated. A woman once said to Mr. Spurgeon, I cannot understand why God should say that he hated Esau. That, Spurgeon replied, is not my difficulty, madam. My trouble is to understand how God could love Jacob, end quote. So we've already seen, you know, if I was one of them guys on the game shows, I'd do that buzzer noise, like, ah, you know, because he's wrong on both. And we've already proved that, without, I think, without a shadow of a doubt, from just the immediate context of Romans 9. Spurgeon said his difficulty was, was it's kind of like a, yeah, he hated Esau, and I understand why. And so he was saying that God looked and saw Esau's sin. That's why it was conditioned on sin. In other words, God's hatred here was conditioned on justice rather than sovereignty. That's what Spurgeon was saying, which, which violates the text of Romans 9. And then, he's, then what's worse, I think, is even saying that he has trouble understanding how God could love Jacob. And we already saw how God loves any of the elect. It's in, by, and through Christ. You know, we are chosen and loved in a representative. He doesn't love you for you. He loves you for Christ's sake. And if you start talking like this, like he's doing, it's going to be weird. We're going to start, like, examining one another and ourselves and wondering, well, maybe there is something uh, in me, or, uh, or you take this false humility thing, and it gets really weird. It's just all mixed up. It is unbiblical from start to finish. And that's not the only thing Spurgeon has said that I disagree with. So we can, I can tell you after, after uh, when we're at lunch, if you want to know. Well, I'm going to wind it down here. Um, the rest of this just kind of just reassures and, and just keeps going on uh, who he is and what he has the right to do. And... Um, you know, the strong language about being fitted to destruction. This word destruction has to do with ruin or loss, damnable per perdition, and so on, waste. And so this is a, you know, you talk about different vessels. Sometimes that's talked about. If you were a potter, you know, some people would say, I would make a pretty vase or whatever, you know. And then on the other side, one for the other dishonorable use, it be something to do with a toilet or a spittoon or 
I don't know, maybe people just set it up and shoot it with the AR-15, you know? It's the potter's choice. That's the point. But that language is there, again, to show the vast spread, the wide gulf, of the, and, and the wider you make it, and when we're over here on the elect side, you look over there and say, <laughs> I, I, you, you know, you feel it in your experience. If it was conditional, I'd be over there. Every time for sure. Uh, the chief of sinners argument that sometimes, hopefully, some of us argue with Paul. I would think a good, healthy believer argues with Paul, no, I'm the chief of sinners. So that, that is the attitude. This causes us to be brought down low and to be humbled and to be thankful that he did choose us in Christ. Salvation conditioned on Christ in, in, in every aspect. Him having the preeminence. So he's going he's gonna to show his wrath and make his power known among these vessels of wrath. And then it says in verse 24, uh, it's, it's part of the end of the question, in whom he also called not only of the Jews, but also of the, of the nations or the Gentiles. Uh, so it's not just, this is not just a Jewish thing, right? I mean, that stuff, is crazy in the news when it comes to this Israel thing, right? I support Israel. Which one? You know, maybe you support both. Maybe the one I'm talking about and that one. It's up to you on the on the one. But spiritual Israel is the key in 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 the scripture. As far as this national thing, um, I got some news. Maybe some bad news. That's over with. That's the old covenant. And that system was the first. That, I watched that movie, A Thief in the Night. That's what got me down front, the eschatology movie. It's kind of like Left Behind, kind of same thing. They were cutting people's heads. If you had to get to heaven, you had to get your head cut off. And I thought, i got to get down front. They had, a, they had a three-wheeler going around with a guillotine, cutting people's heads off. That got me down front. That was all about this wrong view of this nation of Israel being God's chosen people. And so the idea there is there's two peoples. There's the regular old saved people, and then there's Israel. You know? Wrong Israel. The spiritual seed that, that uh, uh, that's, I could do a, let's do a series on that maybe next time. Anyway, the eclipsing of God's election unto salvation and condemnation, the eclipsing of it, with this wrong view of eschatology, of end times. I mean, that's wicked to, to move God's election out of the way in reference to salvation. Well, let's put something in its place. No, thank you. And you can say that without being uh, anti-Semitic. I don't have anything against Jewish people at all. There are believers, part of the remnant, right? You got the remnant of the Jews and Gentiles, and they're put together in one new man, it says in Ephesians, right? And that middle wall of partition has been broken down by the death of Christ. So again, God's overarching purpose, I just remember that. God's overarching purpose in his degree, decree is to glorify himself in the death of Christ and remember, we talked about that magnification of his character in the cross. That is the most magnified that you can see God is that interchange of activity, what took place at the cross where the Father, I mean, Christ signed up for it in the covenant, right? And you think about all the things that were talked about. Of He was came down as born of a woman, born under the law, to keep the law, and so on. And then as he did his earthly ministry. Um, he said some things that the self-righteous religious people didn't like. And what did it do? It seemed like every time he was able to slip out from the crowd and they picked up stones to stone him, but he got away. And then he would be asked things. He said, my hour is not yet come. And it kept, and then it was, Father, my hour is come. Here it comes. 
the fullness of time, what we've been waiting for. And then in the space of three hours, he suffered and, and satisfied law and justice and said it is finished. And then the resurrection was proof that the Father accepted that sacrifice. And we will be worshiping the Lord for that activity, for who he is as the Lamb throughout all eternity. And it's not like we're going to, uh, you know, go through the, the gates and want to see uh, Grandma or Grandpa or Cousin Johnny or, or whatever. That's what we hear in religion. Some people are looking for their pets, too. Anyway, I skipped like 40 minutes of my notes anyway, so I'm done. I appreciate, again, I appreciate uh, this. And just a little soundbite here, a little advertisement, and I can help you find it. These three messages were original. I got them on YouTube, and they're longer. They're more detailed. If you want to uh, look at those, I can get those links to you somehow. But I appreciate your attention, and I uh, hope you got uh, something out of this, and it was uh, enough Christ in there to satisfy your souls. Thank you.